you very much, Brian and Angela, for this uh, wonderful presentation and this um, again, cross disciplinary, extra disciplinary, let's say, journey through uh, uh, different media strategies in the post, of, let's say, second half of the 20th century. Uh, we are very happy that Marijn Aan Amstis is here to respond to it, and I would like to open the discussion by asking Marijn to reflect on uh, the lecture and perhaps also on the lecture of Armin, if he wants to, and then open the debate more, let's say, more general about, let's say, this presentation and also a bit concluding the, uh, let's say, one and a half days that we now had, um, working in a way through mostly your ideas of the last few years. And um, I think also trying to think Let's say maybe this is a sort of a thought to the to the to the audience, trying to think how this kind of practice and how this kind of understanding of geocaching can affect our own practice, and if you have questions on that line, uh, to explore in this last hour of the day to see if we can make somehow all these ideas really relevant and concrete for our own situation here. Uh, but that's more let's say what I imagine we do try to achieve in the next uh, small hour. But first, my would you like to? Yeah, maybe uh, I should respond by uh, going a bit, a bit back into history. Uh, and actually, the first time I, uh, I became familiar with uh, Brian's work, and it was by reading uh, an essay which was published on that time, which is a kind of new media activism mailing list, uh, which was called The Flexible Personality. And it was basically uh, an analysis uh, of uh, how you had like Fordism, and, which was just explained uh, I think pretty properly, uh, and the rebellion of '68. Uh, let's say the artistic critique against uh, Fordism, the hierarchy, the uh, universality of it. Uh, I mean, just having uh, one aesthetic for everybody. Uh, and basically, um, based on a reading of uh, Butonsky and Chapello, then going on to say, well. After 68, uh, capitalism integrated most of these demands. Uh, uh, the demand for um, for uh, an alternative lifestyle uh, just uh, went into uh, niche marketing. Uh, the demand for like uh, an end to nine to five work uh, started the entire sort of uh, flexible work ethic and being mobile with your laptop everywhere. Uh, I mean, all, all the demand for like free sexuality was incorporated in, into sex as the, the, the main uh, selling point of of different um, different products. So basically, this whole text was talking about that the artistic critique uh, of '68 no longer worked, and that we had to come towards like a new kind of uh, critique. Uh, and whereas it, we had. It was basically on, on this dichotomy. You had the, the authoritarian personality you know, of uh, the Frankfurter Schule, uh, which was related to Fordism, and now we should come to a critique of the flexible personality. This was basi basically the, the, this essay. And for me, it was, it was like 2002, I think, so, and for me, it was a very, uh, very influential uh, essay that actually also informed my activism because at that Point I was uh, I just finished uh, uh, being very active in the anti-globalization movement and wanting to do something with that, and I started a group which was called Flexmans, which was actually a reflection on on uh, the flexible personality and kind of this uh, process of uh, flexibilization of the labor market, outsourcing, all these kind of changes which were happening uh, back then in the Netherlands. So I mean. So for me, uh, Brian's work, uh, at the same time as it is really encyclopedic and, and really uh, it's meta meta, uh, and uh, uh, but actually the, there's a richness in there. Uh, there's so much little gems in there which I can you can translate uh, to your daily life, no? Uh, so in, in, in this particular uh, respect, it, it was uh, a reflection on, on flexibility and which then came to inform uh, uh, a movement that was there and, and like, it's now less active, but started to mobilize around the issue of precarity. Basically the idea that people uh, don't uh, control uh, most of the basic uh, conditions of their life anymore, instead you, you, you are waiting for a call 
from your boss to, to tell you when you can work. You have to negotiate because you don't have a fixed contract for, for your house. Uh, you, you have a, a conditional uh, health care, which is based on whether you have work or not. All these kind of new systems that started coming into place uh, uh, in these last years. Um, so, I mean, that was basically my, my introduction by, by sort of trying to give it hands and feet, uh, a particular example. But I think we, we can do that with lots of uh, different aspects of uh, Brian's work, because it's truly <laughs> cyclop and, and cyclopedic. So what, what, um, what I think, for me, uh, living in the Netherlands, uh, with both uh, Brian's work and Armin's work, uh, what I find, uh, what, what I don't find there, and, and this is maybe probably pretty normal because uh, it kind of contain everything, uh, is a, a much more addressing certain local specificities, uh, especially because in the Netherlands there's been like a very strong return to uh, local identity and uh, the discussion uh, around Dutch national identity, uh, or even in Europe the discussion, uh, I mean in France and in Germany and in, in, in Austria and in, in Italy, I mean everywhere uh, this this discussion has, has assumed uh, the first place now on the political scene. So um, I think for me this has led me to uh, be somewhat critical of the technological focus. Uh, I mean, I, I also saw the, the tale of this entire new media scene in, in uh, uh, especially in Amsterdam was one of the centers of it. Uh, and. Uh, everybody was reflecting uh, on, on the newest technological developments all the time. Huh? So, okay, we have the internet, now we have the blogs. Okay, wow, what, what, what is blogging? What does it do to the writing process? And then we have the, the iPod, and then we, we have uh, Facebook, and we have to reflect on Facebook and privacy. And then we have, you know, uh, now we have uh, the, the iPad, and how that's uh, protected by, by Apple with, through different kind of technological means. So this, uh, at a certain point, I got a bit, whereas like the entire country here in the Netherlands started to be <coughs> basically taken over by by uh, quite uh, uh, alarming uh, uh, right wing campaign. Uh, I found out that a lot of people were still uh, reflecting on uh, the technological process going on and what kind of art you could make from that and uh, and. Then I started to go like, well, look, I mean, technology is, is interesting and, and it, does, um, it does shape our lives in the sense that, for example, post fordism no, the, the way the whole production process got flexibilized and, and fragment, uh, fragmentized and, and all that, um, does change uh, my life being much more flexible than someone on a 9-to-5 contract with all the typical uh, rights of the, the 70s. But it's not everything, you know? and, and I think for, for, for me, uh, what Armin said before, uh, that there's too much talk about the superstructure. <laughs> I think there's too little talk about the superstructure uh, uh, and, and the relationship uh, between uh, the two, no? between economy and superstructure, and uh, that uh, there's often, uh, it's just taken as at base, uh, face value. So uh, that's what I think for me is, is a new, uh, new thing necessary to, to discuss and that's why I got really much into Gramsci yeah, uh, and, it's, and it's funny to, to also see, see him coming back with Germany and, and coming back with uh, well, also with Fordism uh, mm -hmm. he talks about a lot uh, about that but basically what he said is that uh, the field of culture is like highly contradictory no? uh, the especially popular culture uh, and there is lots of conceptions that that um, basically contradict each other, and that it's it's actually uh, uh, it should be our effort in, in actually trying to somehow uh, shape go shape that culture in a in a direction that would be more humane and more uh, interesting and less uh, let's say antagonistic in a ethnical or, or let's say religious way. And uh, I mean that's a bit where I'm at, but I'm already talking for some time. Yeah, no, I think it's a very nice local, let's say, local response to uh, 
let's say, what we've been talking about in the last two days. And um, I think I, I also can, uh, can refer it back to, to yesterday when we were talking a lot about these different scales going from the internet to the global and all the layers in between. And that, let's say, finding a, a way in which we can somehow, let's say, tra yeah, travel in between all these different scales all the time is one of the, let's say, essential tasks that lies ahead of us in today's world. And there goes your microphone. Yeah, um, <laughs> um, but, uh, but maybe you can say something if you see a relationship between, and maybe Angela as well, between this, let's say, this focus on how technology uh, produces a certain subjectivity and how that reflects back to the current uprise of, let's say, the discourse on national identity again in many parts of Europe, and not just in the, in the Netherlands. Yeah. In many parts of the world. I yeah. mean, it's as strong in the United States and, and perhaps stronger than in Europe since it started earlier in the United States. It started at the beginning of the last decade, you know? And you, you, we've been living since then through this incredible disjunction between the continuous advance of the computerized uh, economic system and its, its continually more intense financialization and you sort of come off of, you know, connecting to 13 different types of media in the last quarter of an hour and, and you turn around to another one, an old one, the TV, and somebody is, is pumping out another racist, fascist, police state type discourse uh, and, and winning popularity with that, doing it in a way that plays on uh, some, uh, some, some aspects, in our case it's the frontier spirit, it's the national pride, it's, it's the upstanding uh, values of the small town citizen that wants to keep their, their place as clean and nice and idyllic as it was when they had just stolen it from the Indians, you know? I mean, that's what's happening in the U.S. And I think that this disjunct is actually the connection. I think that the intensity of the machine system that's now entering into a crisis and of all its organizational forms, of all the things that Armin talked about, it's never just about technology. It's all, in, and not at, not at all. In fact, I think the primary thing is the organizational form that demands a certain kind of technology and continues to develop it. Our organizational form is transnational, it's flexible, it concentrates on the leading elements, which are what finance is, the directive elements, and subordinates with exactly the kind of thing that you described, the, the sort of instant messaging system of how to work, how you must work on demand, it subordinates the workforce to that symbolic uh, leading edge of, of finance. And of course people get angry and they also don't even know what they're angry about. They're also, but many things they do know what they're angry about. They're angry that the, that the world is being transformed and that their li immediate living environment is being transformed for purposes in which they have no say, in which we have no say, in which really only the, the very uh, uh, richest spec part of the population has any say. And I think in that situation, I mean, I, I agree, I mean, I think in my, my, this new phase in my work has not yet reached the place where it's going. It's, if, if I decided to turn back and concentrate on these sort of um, really, really very spooky and kind of brutal moments of the Second World War and the after the war, it's because I really felt them coming back in similar forms from the middle 2000s onward. And I'm wondering, and I know that they were attached to a machine system at that time. And of course, these machine systems never disappear, but, but nonetheless, things have changed tremendously and the same sorts of forms are coming back now. And I, I, you know, we, I think I can feel like anyone that that this, this, that curve there is on the rise, you know, what's going to happen with it, I don't quite know, but definitely I wanted to return to this thing that I had opened up in the flexible personality, which was a consideration of way, the way that the, par the paradigm of the Second World War had morphed into another paradigm, and I, now I think we're starting with yet a, a third, you know, metamorphosis, this is a thing that's very, very important, but there's just one remark I have concerning what you said, it's interesting that, um, you know, when I was writing that text, it took me a long time to write, and Boltanski and Chiappello's book appeared while I was writing it, and I found it a great confirmation of the ideas that I was trying to put forth. But there was, there's one part with which I don't really agree at all, and that is the notion that all of the um, transformative gestures and innovations and discoveries and, and explosions also of the 60s and 70s were folded back into uh, the new sort of regime. I think that there's, 
We were talking about this in Berlin when we first did this performance, the question of what remains. Angela was bringing up the question of, of what is, a, uh, what you call in French, a reste, something that's not absorbable, something whose, whose evolution began at a certain point and actually goes on. It's just a bit, the focus, uh, there's no more mainstream focus on it. It's not showcased anywhere. It continues to, uh, a sort of line of experimentation opens up and continues, and you can really feel that in the activist movements. Now, there are times when that continuity is a problem, and I do agree with you that, that uh, uh, well, I think the people who got fascinated with technology, I think that's actually another problem, but, they, 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 you know, whatever. I mean, you have to know that the corporations want your blood and you should, you should quit giving it to them at a certain point, you know, but when there's no longer any sort of possibility to subvert that, which is the case now. But I think what's more interesting is a deeper experimentation, and I think that that deeper experimentation, I mean, it echoes throughout the development of the capitalist democracies from basically from 1848 onward throughout the series of, of important uprising and throughout the, the more subtle series of, of perturbations in the norm of, of the uh, Western European North American societies. And that I'm very, very interested in. How to make, how to find the ways, because I don't see what other forces are going to resist, you know. I don't see... I see a very successful use of that old Fordist machinery of creating a majority out of people who don't really share that much with each other, but who are statistically cut up and analyzed in such a way that they appear to create a perfect majority, and that majority then is the simplest thing on the market and it prevails, you know? I don't see where, where to resist that except by looking into these, uh, these the latencies of, of experimentation in, in the past and trying to show, to, to transform those latencies into living, uh, living possibilities that can be unfolded in the future. That's, that's kind of the way I'm looking at it myself. And Angela, um, in, in to, um, let's say, do you, let's say, share this analysis of Brian, let's say, of the current state of the, um, let's say, sort of, um, the sort of repeat of the, what happened after the Second World War in that respect? And do you, um, um, and in what kind of way do you, do you, does this kind of, let's say, performative installation respond to that in your, let's say, in your view? I think there is, uh, of course I share a lot of, of this, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I think uh, there is, of course, differences. I mean, for me, for example, the notion of biopolitics is, a, is, a, is an important one, mm -hmm. where the control society is, uh, <clears throat> operated from one to the next, so the microscopic relation or any kind of relation becomes part of the power system or the systems of power, if you want to say so, and that other things actually take place. So we have, like in the 50s, a problem with the, with norm, with the establishment, establishment of norms, so there is a kind of a new relation today between precarity and normativity that is extremely important, so in, in a sense we don't have the kind of normativity systems that we had in the 50s that you can still, you can see very well in the whole way of how, even how films are shot and are composed and, and, and staged and everything. But, um, <clears throat> but the normativi norma normativity is exercised in a different, uh, different immediate uh, and uh, constant immediate way. So um, the whole idea of uh, um, community building in there or something like uh, off space is actually an entire, entirely new one because it needs to be to address uh, the experimentation of something thinkable on, in terms of human relations and that an approach to the normative or is, is uh, uh, somehow yeah, thought about and not in the way like uh, we have seen it in 68 when there was a breakdown of a representative uh, it was taking place at that time so but it's it's today it is it is uh, not possible so we have to think about this this negotiation between what has to be sustained and what has to be changed uh, and, uh, and we cannot just easily revolt against a one uh, kind of a system in that we say, okay, we need to break down this, uh, this terror of normativity which regulates the working, the precarious work market situation that everyone in the cultural sector becomes completely uh, non-critical because it is all about the possibility of a job or not a job where hierarchies are played out in an incredible way 
as if uh, there was no 60s and 70s happening, even though, I mean, really unbelievable, the, the directors and assistants and people, loads of people working in the cultural sector for no money, for years, young people that get going into the things and only have accessibility to a potential work market. So the whole question of accesses is a very important one and there, for me, in relation to mobility, of course, this is a long discussion for me, since I'm coming out from a lot of uh, migration politics as well, where, access, where borders and accessibility has been discussed a lot. Uh, but here we have unmittelbar, uh, uh, yeah, and and it is an accessibility here means something something else, and the table of negotiation is a different one. Uh, and it is completely uh, beyond the, um, it's beyond the, and the individual, it's beyond the, a form of uh, subjectivity, of, of a thought, how we think subjectivity, because it is directly, our skin is directly beyond our body, it's directly on the molecular, it's directly on the, in, in, so, this, this is very, very different. On the one hand, it is, uh, uh, um, it, it's promising in that sense because it's really urgent, so then it needs, they need a new phase of experimentation, but not an experimentation which is a killing one in that sense, but one which is actually establishing this possibility between uh, a continuation of something and a transformation. So big question is transformation, of course. How tra to transform in this kind of condition? It's very important, yeah. and I, I think um, <clears throat> um, I, I'm not so uh, pessimist in that sense, as uh, because I think if we if we uh, if uh, something starts in terms of develop of a possibility to find uh, um, a new way of life, let's put it like that, that. Uh, uh, actually can deal with this form of uh, mental control uh, and uh, exercise through media and through systems of accessibility and through uh, then it will be uh, it will be this Guattarian kind of uh, transversal from the micro to the macro making a huge uh, you know and it's <laughs> like to work <laughs> <laughs> so uh, because yeah, I think it's, it's it's a very urgent question. It's not anymore, you know. It's I think it's it's so urgent. It's not a luxury. It's, uh, <laughs> but you never know when those, that's going to happen. But you have to work for it, you know. I mean, I agree. So. Yeah, and yeah, if I think then, um, let's say one of the, uh, let's say this is a the uh, a big question. I mean, we can only attack let's say one one thing at a time or um, address elements of. And one of the elements which I think sort of surfaced um, in the last two days and which is um, I think also um, in a very interesting way in the, in the lecture performance we just witnessed, but is the relationship between let's say big theoretical understand, uh, analysis of a certain situation and how you in the end then practice them, let's say how you on the one hand insert them into the public debate and also how they um, let's say um, yeah, in themselves maybe have to be lived in a different way because that's what, uh, sort of a thing that I was thinking looking at the, at the performance lecture. Um, that um, um, again, coming back to this idea of scale, that somehow this felt like a sort of very intimate articulation of what uh, what Arnon was doing in a very let's say um, uh, that's more uh, schematic and uh, and uh, diagrammical uh, way in the in the in the first part of the day, and that. Um, Maybe this also responds to, to what you were um, addressing, like the, the difficulty in, in how to, um, let's say, find points, let's say concrete points in our current, let's say, actual life, where you can see this problem manifest itself between, let's say, this technological domination and um, the, the, the wish that you feel to, to somehow find different forms of subjectivity that can somehow negotiate it. Um, that where can we find those points, and how can we act? Yeah, let's say activate them. How can we can we um, uh, practice that? And does let's say does a, a different kind of intimate practice of theory is is that a necessity for that for your view? Or? Can I just say one thing? 
uh, because for the for the question you have told before in terms of and also for you know the famous uh, recuperation of sixty eight, mm -hmm. uh, which is of course uh, I think uh, also a very problematic thing because uh, um, <coughs> because it's uh, it's not looked at. I mean. We, like Maurizio also, with his uh, research of Andres Antimitonti Spectacles, it is clear that we didn't have a, 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 a cultural production, artistic production, was not looked at social, sociological in the last 40 years. There is no serious sociological research beside of the Antimiton in Europe that has been done about how culture and how, uh, how culture is produced and how artists work and what are the conditions, who is involved and so on, how is the whole market coming up. So this is not a, it's not possible to just look at the formal result and from this specific historical kind of, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> point of 40 years later and how forms are re... Uh, I think this is, for me, why uh, something like that because uh, uh, it needs, uh, with cinema, with moving pictures, with all these, we ha and with all its forms, also in the 20th century of non-linearity, of computer programming, and so on, we have, of course, a possibility to look on history in a different way, and it's not so linear, it is a, it's another kind of a flow, it's another kind of junction point, and so on, and I think this is very important in order to kind of, uh, like what are, you know, di discover maybe the brighter future of 68, as Armin was uh, telling it in his uh, end of the lecture, mm -hmm. in another way. Yeah, yeah, what, what I say on that level is that, um, to, to kind of make more specific what Angela has just been saying, the way I make it specific in, in my current uh, experimental practices in the United States, it's very different from in the 90s. It's really interesting that in the 90s you had this sort of uh, moment where the molecular started to become massive, where people started seizing these tools. And it's, it's really clear that that was then vastly expanded by the intervention of uh, something coming from, you know, at once from the outside and from what clearly was the element of globalization. It was, it was Marcos, you know, it was the Zapatistas. And we were, we were energized by that. We were given models by that that seemed to be so appropriate to what was what what we had to resist and what we also had to invent what we could invent in those moments and now I feel like like scene is very very different and, and I'm, I'm totally with Marianne on that one and I do feel like there has to be a way of making I, I don't know I wouldn't say intimate I would say territorial these uh, old ancient preoccupations with trying to change society because well, the scale that's now impinging upon us is exactly that one. It's the close one, the intimate and the territorial one. It's then translated uh, into, uh, into the images of nationalism, you know? And so well, the response has to be a different translation. It has to be coming to grips with the reality that takes place on all kinds of different grounds, which are urban and also rural, which are suburban. Uh, which are peripheral to the city centers, or which could also be in those city centers, but which take place on the scale of a neighborhood, of, of a stretch of countryside, and so on and so on. And I know many, many, many people around the world who are involved in these things. What I don't see in them yet is how do you have the expansiveness of what's always been the great mainstay of the left, internationalism, on the terrain of the neighborhood, on the terrain, on this... And I don't think we can do without it. So what, what, I mean, our strategy has been to go out and what, to what looks like the most standardized terrain of all, namely the one we live in, <laughs> and, uh, and find there uh, so many uh, people who don't conform to those norms and who want to imagine a life without the kinds of norms that are weighing down upon them. And this, this might be a strategy, and it might be a dead end, I don't know. You just have to try, you know. Yeah, I, was, I was struck by the, 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 uh, the little speech uh, Marcos gave, you know, on, on, uh, about normal people not being screened on TV. And I think we, I mean, it's probably not a total recuperation or anything, but uh, if you've seen the advance in reality TV these last years, <coughs> especially in this country you now with Big Brother and uh, the Robinson Island and all these kind of things, which is basically being 
doing exactly that. Normal everyday people can apply and put them on an island and make a soap out of it. And I was also really struck by seeing, I don't know if you've seen that, uh, the Sarah Palin started make, uh, is now making a soap uh, about her life in Alaska, which is probably completely fictional, but she goes out into Alaska with her family and fishing and watching the bears. Uh, meanwhile, making political comments about uh, the bears being mama bears, protecting their cubs, like sort of right-wing American feminism should be all about. And uh, so I think in that sense, uh, the, somehow, yeah, reality TV has, has, has turned the whole process around. We, we, we see more and more like, let's say, normal people becoming the subject of television, but it's intensely scripted by by the editorial, so it's not it's not a free play. <coughs> but uh, so I, I think that in a certain uh, certain I don't know how, how it happened, but we've become very alienated from let's say the cultural mainstream, and sometimes I feel this distance as like a, uh, yeah as a big chasm, which which sort of needs to be overcome, and we actually need to. Uh, be able to plug back into the mainstream uh, somehow. But I, I, I don't know, I mean the, border, the borders are from all sides, I mean I don't think that it is, it's actually maybe not only, you know, like the one has to, the one <coughs> group has to approach the other group or whatever, I mean the production of uh, reality TVs with uh, uh, in like suburbs of Cologne, where I was right recently, for example, in Cologne's RTL city, you know, uh, it's uh, the major television city of Germany, like private television, not uh, state television, so it's uh, Big Brother is shot there, all these shows are produced there, and it is englobing the proletarian youth of the suburbs in being the ones who are accessing it in all these contests and, you know, whatever castings to be part of, so the only possibility to produce or to, to work in that sense for them is to be, become part of that kind of a production in some ways there. And if they can't go into the, come to the television studio, they at least come uh, until the discotheque where there are the same kind of uh, selection processes in terms of castings in front of the doors and so on and so on. So you have a, a constant production of the self along production of a normative image which is kind of intertangled with the whole, uh, you know, possibility of economy and the possibility and uh, an aesthetic uh, regime and so on. So now to interfere, to, to interfere here or to do something here, uh, it's, <clears throat> uh, it's 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 the problem of how to to deal with this. What is on the negotiation table and what is under the negotiation table actually? It's, it's and this is not at all like you can tell that we have to approach, I mean, it's, it's a problem of borders per se on and how to make them porous and how to negotiate, them, <coughs> how to have this incredible borders which are built into the languages through the norms and through all these things, but how you can uh, actually uh, uh, transform them. I think it's, I don't, I don't, I, I don't feel uh, easy with this, uh, this uh, attempt to, to make new classes, like this is now the new uh, creative class, the new art class, and here is the new proletarian class, and then we have a new funny class uh, struggle here, and, it, and then maybe we can even think of an old class struggle and it would help us, it would, won't help us. Yeah, I don't think. Because it's an entirely different world. Yeah, maybe it's also time to, let's say, break one boundary a bit down and make boroughs, and that's the boundary between the stage and the auditorium. Because are there already comments from the from the audience who would like to also to ask questions or to uh, respond to what's been said or shown? I mean, it, it was um, it was a little bit response to, to just what what Andrew said, or it reminded me where you said about you know that, that people are still trying to reconstruct the class uh, the class war um, given given the new circumstances. And I suppose I, I was thinking in general that a lot of the talks have led up to this moment of crisis in two thousand and eight, and then but then what's happening 
now seems to be much more difficult to define than it should be, in a sense, or much more according to those waves, yeah, in a sense that we should be at the point where these emergent either technologies or ways of, of thinking uh, and understanding a different social uh, uh, construction, a different society in emergent, might be beginning to be to take shape. And it seems to me that we're, we're not there yet <laughs> um, uh, as we... I may, and maybe I'm maybe I'm misplacing my uh, my expectations here to some extent, but but I it, it feels that this response to the last two two and a half years or so, where there's been a particular crisis, which maybe started indeed in the in the in the beginning of the of this uh, millennium, um, is um, is still is still rather uncertain and incoherent beyond sort of calls to liberté, égalité, fraternité, and things like that, or to class war. That we're still often those people that are questioning the status quo are often still not sure where the, the, the horizons might lie beyond those old ones. And it, it seems to me that that's a sort of challenge. And maybe what I was going to say is, is, is what you were saying, this, this idea of the neighborhood or the territorial and the relationship there might be a place where some of those can be found and that might be how to connect well, up think, between I one and the other. You know, I think it's one thing, but I mean, I, I think the people after the financial crisis that became explicit in September 19, uh, 2008, uh, people then said for about two years, and where's the, where's the response, you know? There should be some response according to Marx's theory, right? The question is, how do, how do you start responding? I mean, that's the only, that, there won't be any response until people are asking this themselves the question, how do I start responding without being able to ride on the wave that isn't there? Because that's how a wave gets started, is when people respond because they can't stand the fact of being passive, you know. So there's that, and people people are responding, and, and, and I, I'm not expressing myself well enough because uh, when I talk about a, a territorial thing, for instance, the student movements in, in Europe, in uh, North America too, have been very strong responses. The, the housing uh, movements in North America and the United States have also been strong responses to the crisis, and they both they both take something that is the first degree of your experience, what you're directly involved with, whether it's the university for the students or the people who are losing their, their home for, for those people, you know? And, and those, uh, uh, those beginnings of responses are, I think, are extremely interesting. And, and one of the reasons I decided to go back to America was I thought maybe I could be more useful there, you know? I think there's a lot going on in Europe, as far as I can tell by reading the newspapers and getting the emails back in the United States, you know. So there's these things going on. Uh, it's, it's certainly time to start creating some forms in the midst of those things, you know. And, and, and I think that's an, uh, a really useful thing to do is to create forms because that can, that can add to, that can, that can expand and, and, and give uh, potential to all sorts of social movements that are happening. I mean, Armin, you commented that this is, uh, uh, this is the time of like, uh, you know, the counter-globalization movement over is over, that time is over, because now there's a whole new wave of activism that's uh, unfurling all over the place. So, I don't know if you want to remark about that. I don't know exactly which remark you are referring to, I but... The uh, email that you wrote yeah. me said yeah. the governmentality thing is exaggerated, uh, we need to look at the, the national dynamics, but in these national dynamics, there is really a, a, a beginning of a, a strong wave of activism. I hope so. But what I wanted to say was uh, actually relating to something just before that. Um, I, thi I think maybe the three steps which I try to describe as briefly as possible. Once there's this great analysis by uh, a guy called Benniger about the control revolution, and he basically says that by 1950, even without computers, information society did already exist um, in principle because what that was, it was a response to a control revolution which happened uh, in, in, the, in the 19th century, a crisis of control. The increase of the, the, increase of the flows of matter, of stuff, was so big that nobody knew anymore what was going on. So that's why an information society had to be built. And mm, I think by the 60s, what happened, there was a crisis of communication. 
So there were all this image forming of a cybernetical society, but a few focus groups and a little bit of Nielsen metering that wasn't enough feedback. And the media were basically still one way and broadcast media. So in the 60s you have rising the media activism, the early forms, uh, student radio, independent free radio movement, all sort of participatory media, and then comes the internet. And I think it's no coincidence, maybe there was a real need for the back channel that was there. Without back channel, the crisis of communication would have been much worse. So what do we have now? I don't think we have too much communication. I mean, the crisis of communication has been resolved to some point, and it's only certain people who always only talk about information overload. And I, I mean, that discussion about information overload, these people are either technically incompetent or they have some other agenda, because you can sort those things. Computers are really good at reducing the redundant stuff and you only keep the important stuff. But my feeling, and that's really just an intuition, and that leads back, for instance, to the student protests, is that um, I think we have a strike of communication now. That is, the upper class, the leading classes, or not the not leading classes, they are on strike. Like there was a strike of capital in the 70s. They are now making a strike of communication because all those communication channels would be there. They could be listening, but they just say simply, I just don't listen. Uh, I'm not talking to you. I go on with government in the old style. For example, with the whole student thing, in Austria the student meeting a movement has been very strong, very good, and, and they just simply didn't react at all. Nothing. And recently there was a sort of peak summit meeting between um, uh, university uh, directors uh, or deacons and uh, and student representatives, and the student representatives walked out, and they later said, we walked out because the top people from government were sitting there, they were totally ignorant, they hadn't dealt with the issues, and they also, they simply didn't listen to anything that we said, so there was no communication, so that's why they left the meeting. And, yeah, and maybe that's going on in, in other areas. Does anybody want to respond to that? Or is there another question from the audience? Yeah. I'm not sure it's really a proper question. It's relating more to something that we talked about yesterday here, which was um, uh, Brian's um, things about territory, intimacy, ter territorial, the um, <coughs> national, the continent, continental, and the global. And I was thinking about. I spoke to Stephen about this. Actually. I think about it, one could do that, that, that space, and what happens if you do that with time? So you get the instantaneous, you get the, the I don't know, the daily, the yearly, and you end up with the epoch or infinity or whatever. And thinking how, about how those things also affect the way in which we behave, of course. And then I was coupling that with something that Charles said, which is. Um, that maybe something that comes out of this debate could influence the path that the museum takes. And I thought, well, I mean, that's a great offer. Here's our chance to influence the path this museum takes. But I, and, and linking that back to the issue of time, thinking, okay, what if, totally hypothetical, what if, um, so it's a question for Charles, I suppose, what if you only had five years? And it doesn't matter what you do in those five years with this museum. Um, the museum's going to end after five years anyway, so whatever you do, this is your chance to do it, to go out with a bang. And what, what could you do, what would you choose to do differently if that were the case? Because it's kind of like if you're doing a theatre production, you think, about what's the Hollywood version that you'd like to aspire to, and you end up doing the kitchen sink version. But by thinking about the Hollywood version, you can go gradually back. So thinking about what, how could the museum be active in changing the world if it's not going to make a difference to its own existence in the future anyway and what could we take from that idea and try to think up a plan for what Charles could do with this museum to change the world? <laughs> Charles? <laughs> I mean, there, there was a... a <laughs> oh, there was a, a, a recording of a, of a conversation that Hannah Hotsik organised between me and, and Brian and I would slightly refer to you to that because I think there were some aspects of the conversation that touched on that question. But I think it is a very good question. I think that uh, 
an institution like this, or we, you know, running it, should speculate about its demise constantly. I mean, we should imagine that it that it should finish, and imagining that it should finish actually is very liberating. Because when you're appointed to a job like this, I mean, I was appointed to this unfolding the fifth chapter, the fifth uh, directorship or whatever, and the assumption would be, of course, there was a sixth, and essentially all I am doing is being a caretaker of a tradition which I simply pass on. And I think it's far more liberating to think about not passing anything on than it is about passing something on. It actually allows certain things to happen. So I think in that sense, it, it's, it's, it's true to, be, to, 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 to not think about eternity, which is also connected to the idea of the collection and the preservation and conservation and things like that. I think it's very useful. I think if you ask the, the, the uh, question directly that it's going to close in five years, I think, to be honest, I'd have to say that I would do less in Eindhoven and I would do less in this building. I mean, I think that would be the very honest answer, that I would... Um, and we might do that anyway, whether it is the last six years, or five years or not. But I think there's a case for thinking about, if we think about these territories that, that, uh, that Brian's talking about, thinking about where, where is it appropriate to act. Uh, of course, when is appropriate to act is also important, but where is appropriate to act? And one of the control systems that's on this is that the appropriate place to act is always given as Eindhoven. And I think that would be something, if you knew it was going to die anyway, I think the one, so you wouldn't have to worry about political justification of being here, then I think the one thing you would do is, on the one hand, work in a very local way in the city, I mean, in local communities and things, and not anticipate that they would ever walk through the museum, but actually work together with artists in those communities. I think the second thing is that you would, you would um, go into the Rif in Morocco or something, where half the population of certain areas of, uh, of uh, Eindhoven come from, and, and, and work there. As much. I would say it's 50% Eindhoven, 50% okay, so of the world. The question is then, if the museum's reasons. not going to be given up, how can you implement those ideas anyway in the non Hollywood footprint and sing version of that? <laughs> well, well, wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, um, I'm, yeah, maybe first, are there, are there more questions from the audience, people who would like to address a particular, particular issue? Well, maybe yeah. one question, because what? you were, Brian put some emphasis on, I don't know, I think everybody can hear me. Okay. Yeah, but you also recorded ah. this way. It has to be, <laughs> oh, that's interesting. It <laughs> <laughs> has to be another interesting yeah. starting point for my question. You'll be in the next performance. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> and and uh, uh, Brian Holmes, you put some emphasis on the, um, on the neighborhood as a concept that you find uh, relevant as, as a place for, for uh, the production of ideas of what the world could be different than the spectacular society that you have been describing in some of your uh, uh, texts. Uh, and then I was, so I have been, and, and, and you say that there is a necessity to come to a different form of what this neighborhood could be like. And now we would be very curious how do you see the performance lecture, the way you've been, you both have tried to work your way in between different. Uh, documents that relate to the functioning of the spectacular society today, on the level of the social and political, etc. How does that relate to this to this idea of the com of the community? Yeah. Because when you say neighborhood, there comes this image very clearly to mind of a group of houses, people living, work. I mean, how how much is this really a neighborhood? How, how, how concrete is that? Is yeah. that is it, yeah. uh, neighborhood is one word of uh, several that describe for me uh, <coughs> territories that I, I think I can work in. I used it because I, I thought it's in a certain, con uh, talking to, to Marine actually, and, uh, but um, for me it's more this, um, in, in the US now I find myself moving from house to house, from uh, from neighborhood to neighborhood, and each time meeting people who are really trying to transform these, these territories where they live, you know? And I find that that is fundamental, and, and at the same time I don't want it to become uh, par parochial. I don't want these, these efforts to turn in on themselves, because I think we're, there's never enough, and you have to make, you have to open up communication and exchange with people who are far away, and also understand some things about the the past and therefore the possible futures. So what I want to do is find ways of becoming more tactile with the, the kind of hard materials that I work with. That is to say, these intellectual constructs 
these attempts to, to rework the Marxist tradition into something that's, that is, uh, no longer resembles the, the many dead ends of that tradition, but does uh, take all that is latent in it and, and try to unfold it in, in our time, you know? And I think that that is, is what needs, that's what I see, see and feel is needing to be done. I mean, it, it seemed to be enough to, to converge on a space uh, where you could have, uh, you know, a, a, a protest at a summit meeting and disrupt that meeting and so on. That seemed to be enough a few years ago. But what, what I realized and so many people realized we were missing were many, many dimensions of, first of all, actual transformation of daily life, actually communicating with people in different ways also to get over these sort of alienated hierarchy problems, you know, actually creating uh, means of cultural production that, uh, that do work and do produce but do not accept this sort of uh, uh, super professionalization like you get also in the United States in a way that doesn't even pretend to be anything else and that way it's different from here. Um, uh, you know? Um, but it's, it's no, it's certainly, I mean, uh, it's, 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 it's great because it's worse because you really know it's the case, you know, whereas here you limp along being, thinking that you might be being fooled but not being sure, you know. Um, so I, I think that, that there's, there's room there to, to, I mean, if they want to pull out a dimension of the national people that seems to come from out of the dark depths of, of periods in time that I would really rather not rem remember, but now I am remembering them, <laughs> then, then I, I must try to create a different, uh, a different people, that's for sure. This people is, doesn't act in the same way, not only does it not act and dress in the same way, but it doesn't produce, it doesn't dream in the same way. And, and this means that, that we have to be the ones who produce and dream differently. And to do so, I think that, that, that finding a way to thread into lived experience concepts that can both ward off what's coming by being, allowing us to perceive it and point to other possibilities that are not simplified possibilities because I think the simplified ones are fantasies. You have such a strong fantasy among people who, tre uh, who are oppressed by pollution, by toxic waste, by, by toxic media, by uh, uh, really difficult jobs that are difficult to bear. You get uh, the illusion in the United States that you could return to the land, that you could create a kind of pastoralism. This is something very old in, in America, you know. I don't say, I, it's not about fighting against this, it's about playing this out very, very differently. So that the return to what you can actually transform with your own hands, but also with your own mind, with your own tools, with your own media, is not a return to a small thing, but a return to something that's uh, small as you touch it, and large in its capacity to resonate with other people all around the world, and especially for us, especially across the borders that separate us from Canada and from the entire Latin America, starting with Mexico. And so this is, I mean, these territories for me, they're, they're, they're small territories, but one by one, they, they definitely bring me from the second, third biggest uh, Mexican city in the world, Chicago, you know, to Mexico City, and, 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 and on, on to the south, and that's something that interests me and is important to me now. And uh, Angela, could you, in a way, say that your, let's say, that your form that you found in this lecture performance, that, that is in a way an experiment of what you are just describing as being, let's say, touching something uh, that is on the one hand small, and on the other hand, uh, let's say, affects not just, let's say, a sort of poetic or uh, uh, utopian idea of returning to nature, or let's say, going beyond technology or something. I think it's in many you know, art projects is, is uh, this, uh, let's say, aesthetical paradigm, which is maybe the possibility of creating a kind of new chunk of possibility, mm. potentiality in the languages. Mm. And here we have different languages at stake. We are uh, beyond the, I mean, there's, it's just like a montage situation in a sense. So, um, of course, it's, uh, the hopefully uh, transversal from the micro to the macro. In that sense, it addresses uh, time in a different way and it addresses memory in a different way and it addresses, therefore, maybe a language that can be spoken about what, we, what is it, what, is, what has happened or what has happened or all these questions. So I 
think it's uh, in that sense, of course, uh, yeah. aspect, a, a paradigm which can be, you know, used. Yeah. So, but maybe um, um, the um, archive uh, here and the archival question can be seen as a reservoir of subjectivity in a mm. sense also, uh, with its layers of materiality which are, that are inside. As we have discussed many other things that maybe are uh, fundamental for the, I don't know, it didn't, was, I wasn't there yesterday, but let's say the, the kind of uh, you know, mapping of Guattari's uh, understanding of the junction of concepts, territories, flux, and so on. I mean, I think it's, it's a crucial, crucial common kind of a, yeah, you know, yeah. point. <laughs> yeah, I, I see it as a, like, for me, it really reminds me a lot of uh, the movies of Adam Curtis, but then sort of more like a sort of live set where you see the images being mixed together. But is it, I mean, I know it's a reference for Brian, but uh, I don't know, is it also a reference for you? What? Uh, Adam Curtis is like a BBC filmmaker. Um, I, I met him through him. Uh, I mean, I saw the films of him, of, of Curtis, because we were together. But Adam Curtis uh, is uh, not at all uh, a reference for, for what I'm doing here or what we are doing here. Because uh, it is another, I mean, a very interesting practice in terms of uh, um, reading uh, archives or specifically uh, television archives, but its form is actually quite the opposite of what, what's happening here. It's, yeah, it's, it's very monologic, isn't it? Despite the, despite the subtlety of the montage, it's a very monologic sort of form. One voice, one narrative. Yeah, it's a very mainstream form with a non-mainstream content. That's not. That's nothing new. I mean, you know. I mean, the problem is how to address uh, to get out of these forms. And this is maybe a good point because I think the problem. Uh, I mean, in creating relations in neighborhoods or whatever it is, then you know what comes to be at stake is uh, it's sometimes really not funny because if you, as an artist, for example, wants to to talk about a practice or even as an intellectual wants to talk about your work. Of thinking or uh, communicated, it's not about becoming didactic. It's not about yeah. becoming a teacher. It's not about becoming teaching someone something. It's not about the museum, which has a section uh, treating everybody as a, you know patronizing everybody in a infantilizing uh, and so on. Uh, but it is uh, 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 about the potentiality of creating something together. And I think this is. Really, we are really in a very, very restricted and bad, uh, you know, because the normative systems are so strong that people and the precarity is so strong that people are not, they are not used to experiment. They are not used to to to, to take to dare to, to 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 you know make a step in the unknown. It's really difficult. Everybody serves is a security driven, uh, closing, uh, <coughs> repeating, reproducing. Uh, subjectivity, and that's for me even more central than the whole debate on nationality, which I think is a, is a transi transi transition actually mm -hmm. to the real problem, uh -huh. because it's not going to stay on the national problem, it's going to stay on the neighborhood problem in the end, if it's not addressed, you know, because then, then now it's okay, we can say, well, what a bad moment, you know, going back to what kind of national nationalism is really bad. But if we come yeah, to something which is that bad, but on the, you know, on a, on a, then we are... On a face-to-face level, yeah, that's what you're saying, yeah. When it's when it face-to-face, and the other face is in your face. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. No, I think that that's a, a very strong... Um, yeah, let's say remark for the end of the day. Let's say. <laughs> also now to let's say try maybe for a, a short period because I don't know exactly how long we still have uh, to have a drink together and talk about the day. I think it's, uh, I would like to thank again very much Brian Holmes and Angela Meritopoulos and Marijn Amsen and Armand for joining us today and uh, giving us this spectacular journey or spectacular maybe is the wrong word to use in this context. But let's say this very exciting journey. Um, in which I think it's become very uh, clear to me that one of the most um, uh, sensitive elements of today is trying to reconfigure how our intimate, let's say, our regional, territorial, neighborhood life 
is affected by, let's say, mass or vast theories, um, or by a vast technological, technopolitical situation, and that, um, um, let's say, the, the task is not to, let's say, teach people how to understand that this is the case, but to find ways to express different forms of activity or subjectivity within that context, which I think you did marvelously in that, that your performance that you did. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.